to do that. Add one on there and uh, we'll call it good. Hey, we're wel- welcome, glad you're here today. We're in our series on John. And this is one of those weeks where uh, this is the passage that gets skipped over all the time. And so it's one of the good and yet the challenging things that come with, we as a church have a high value of scripture. And we're just gonna kind of preach our way through it. And so I wanna challenge you today not to get lost in the story in the text. Um, There are gonna be two huge theological ideas um, that are gonna challenge you, uh, but I don't want you to get bogged down there to what the main message is that Jesus is trying to get across in this passage. Um, So if you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter six. We're gonna start in verse 22. And if you need a Bible, someone will bring you one to you if you just raise your hand, but we're gonna put it on the screen for you. We also have uh, like little journal books out in the commas that you can grab on your way in. They're free. Uh, I'd encourage you, like you're gonna have questions. You wanna write some of this stuff down so you can study on your own or ask Pastor Dan all the questions you want when we're done, okay. <laughs> Let me start by saying this. Um, Jesus is not unconcerned about the pain or struggle that you have in your life today. Jesus is not unconcerned about the hopes and dreams that you have in your heart or the shattered dreams that have been ripped from you that you've just had to let go of. Jesus is not unconcerned with your present struggle or your future dreams. But... Jesus offers you something much greater than whatever you're currently in, whatever your greatest hopes and desires and dreams might be. Jesus is with you in that, but Jesus offers you something much greater. I think one of the most difficult things for us to kind of work through in this life is that the struggles, the circumstances, the hopes, the dreams, the desires that we have, they can kind of overwhelm us and they can kind of push out any other uh, spiritual thoughts that when somehow I'm, I'm, Jesus is with me because everything is going really, really well in my life, me and Jesus are good. And then when things don't go well in my life or don't work out in the timeline that I want or in the way in which I want them to work out, suddenly like Jesus and I are not good. I don't believe that Jesus primarily came to earth to make your life more comfortable. I don't believe that Jesus primarily came to earth so that you could be richer in this life, that you could have better health in this life. He's not unconcerned with those things, but be very clear. There is a warning in this passage to any pastor that would ever stand up in front of people and say, God wants you to have as much money as you possibly can have. God wants you to have as much happiness in this life as you possibly could have. God wants you to have no problems and no struggles and no circumstances that are difficult in your life. I believe that there is a, there is a, a bait and switch where we, uh, it, it, it's all over. Like if you, have, if you have podcasts, you turn on the TV and you hear preachers, there's this idea that you come sow your seed and whatever that seed is, whatever your greatest hope and desire is, God's gonna give that to you. If you either believe enough or live in a good enough life, live in such a way, or you give money, right? <laughs> and, and I believe that there is a, a taking advantage of people's hopes and desires and dreams to gain power over them in the preaching world. Today, I want to debunk that for you. That is exactly the issue that Jesus is attacking with his people. Let me say it again. I don't believe Jesus is unconcerned about your present struggle, your hopes and dreams, or your shattered dreams. I just don't believe that's the primary reason that Jesus came. Jesus wants us to think so much bigger than that, not be blinded by our circumstances or our desires. Are we good? Okay, the section we're gonna look at today is maybe the longest section. And so we won't be able to spend as much time um, as I would like to on each section. So I won't be able to answer all your questions, but I'm gonna do my best. All right, let's jump in, verse 22. Oh, I wanna say one more thing. Can I say one more thing? This is like, I have to keep looking at my notes. The people that Jesus talks to in this story, that he has this theological discussion with, many of them choose not to follow Jesus anymore. Like they were around Jesus and they wanted to be around him. They were thousands of people following Jesus at this moment and is the height of his popularity. By the time he's done talking, the vast majority of them desert Jesus. There's only a few, a handful that are even left over. It's because of this discussion right here. So the challenge I want to give to you is at the end of this talk, at the end of looking at this, these verses with me, the message that Jesus gives here, 
you will be faced with a choice as well. You will have to make a decision on whether Jesus is the Jesus on your terms or on his terms, and whether Jesus and what he's offering is enough for you or you're going to desert him. I don't think there's a lot of room for wiggle here. I don't think there's room to just kind of be on the fence about Jesus. He's gonna make some pretty amazing claims today. I think I wanna challenge you to make a decision today. Are you in or are you out? And so that, that's the challenge that Jesus gives these people here and I give it to you. Verse 22, the next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. uh, Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into their boats and they went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. So if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to go back on and, on, online and watch that or read the, the verses, the 21 verses prior to this. Um, the, the background for this is the feeding of the 5,000 men or 10 or 15,000 people. And there's this miracle. The two people that Jesus does a miracle for are the people. He feeds the people. But I think he actually does it more for his disciples than he does for the people. Because he, he involves his disciples. It's the only miracle he involves the disciples in. He's like, Philip. What do you want to do? And Philip like tries to solve the problem like Jesus is not right beside him. Like Jesus, we've seen you heal so many people, raise people from the dead. Um, this does not compute. There's no way that we can feed all these people. And Philip forgot his greatest resource is standing right beside him. And so he does that on the Sea of Galilee with him as well. The Lake of Tiberias, when we were there just a few weeks ago, we drove by Tiberias. And so it's really fun for me to read scripture now in a new and fresh way. But that's the background of this story. This is the day after, and the same people that like Jesus was interacting with the day before, they were looking for Jesus, and they're looking for Jesus because they're hungry, and we're going to see Jesus kind of exposes that uh, beginning in verse verse 26, but we're going to read verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus is not at all interested in this conversation. He just cuts right to it. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. So Jesus kind of like, hey, small talk, I don't really want to do this. You're looking for me, not because of the signs. Remember we talked about that last week? When, When John writes signs, it's not just that it's a miracle. When he uses the word signs, it's to point to the person of who Jesus is. The person behind the miracles. And Jesus says it very clear in this verse, doesn't he? He's like, you're not looking for the person behind the miracle or the sign that would point to the person behind the miracle. You're hungry. You, you want more food. And so like your desires, your needs are why you're here. And really you're missing the whole purpose. Again, I think there's a real danger here in, in coming to Jesus on our own terms. I, I think many of us come to Jesus when, hey, your marriage is rough or you have an addiction that you're struggling with or like things aren't working out in your life the way you want them to. And so you come to Jesus for healing. You come to Jesus for comfort. You come for Jesus for hope. Like I just want God to do this in my life. None of that's wrong. What Jesus is saying, I want to invite you into something that's much greater and much more valuable than any physical need that you could have. 27, verse 27, he gets into it and just says straight up, says, do not work for a food that spoils, but for a food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Son of Man is what Jesus called himself on the regular. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So Jesus is saying, hey, all this stuff is temporary. Like you're chasing something that you will be hungry again tomorrow, just like you're hungry today. Let me invite you to something deeper, something spiritual. And this, the son of man, I can give this to you. And the reason I can give it to you is because God's seal of approval is on me. Verse 28, they asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? It's actually kind of a play on words. What's the work that we must work that God requires? And so this is a common misconception in that day. Like, hey, so, okay, what do we got to do though? Like, yes, we want this. You want to give it to us. What, what do I have to do to receive this? And this is a very common misconception today about religion, isn't it? 
uh, mo- a lot of people that I meet when I say, hey, tell me about what you believe about heaven and like what happens when you die. Do you think like if God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? So many people, their answer is, well, uh, you know, I know I've done some bad things, but I think I've done some good works that might offset that. I know that I'm better than my neighbor, like, or my uncle or my brother. Like, I know, like, if he's getting in, I'm for sure getting in. And we kind of measure the, the work, what works do we have to do so that God would say, okay, we're good. You can have eternal life. You can have this eternal uh, spiritual life. Verse 29, Jesus answers them and says, Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Um, this is throughout the number one th- theme throughout the book of John, to believe. John closes the book of John, the gospel of John, and says, I've written all these things with one purpose, that you would believe in Jesus and the one who sent him so that you may have life and have it abundantly. Like that is the whole purpose of John, that you would believe. Make sure that we keep that theme in mind as we come to other verses in the book of John that might lead us to believe something else like, hey, maybe this is true too. Three times in this, in this passage we're going to look at today, John makes it very clear. Believe. Believe, believe. The work that we are required to do is to believe. So that is the work. So they, verse 30, they say, okay, great. Uh, we'll believe in you, but how do we know that we can believe in you? What sign is how they say it? So they asked them, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe in you? What will you do? And then they have a suggestion. Verse 31, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So their response is, okay, okay. If you want us to believe in you, what sign will you give us? Again, indicating the person behind the miracle. And uh, I find that kind of funny because just the day before, the vast majority of this crowd saw Jesus do what? Take a couple pieces of bread, a couple fish, and feed 10, 15,000 people, and there were 12 baskets left over, each one for each disciple, so that each disciple had more than they even started with. Like, it's a pretty amazing miracle. But we're about two and a half years into the ministry of Jesus Christ. It says that he has healed countless people. People that didn't used to walk, they're walking around now. They're talking. Uh, People that used to be dead have now been raised to life. Um, Jesus has done miracle and miracle. Those people have to be around. So they're saying, but what else can you do? And so they give them a suggestion. Like, so Moses, and again, I told you last week, Moses is kind of the backdrop for this entire passage. At the end of this uh, chapter, we find, at the end of our talk today, we find out that Jesus is in Capernaum. He's in the synagogue. He's either teaching or someone else is teaching. And this is the Passover. So they are reading all the, like the, the greatest hits of the Old Testament. They're reading all the greatest hits of the Old Testament, right? And so they're, they're, it's fresh in their mind and they have just read about Moses for sure. They're like, Moses, the greatest prophet that God has ever given us, he did this for 40 years. Like he gave us manna from heaven and quail every day. And, and like, that's what he did. You said, Jesus, that you're greater than Moses. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna give us food for 40 years? Like they're, su- they're giving Jesus suggestions for the sign that they would accept. Verse 32, Jesus, and, and now it's gonna get kind of messy, so stick with me. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. So he corrects him right away. Like you think Moses could do any of that if it wasn't for God. God worked through Moses. So they correct, he corrects their theology. And then he says, my father's gonna give you true bread from heaven. Verse 33, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. We see this over and over, Jesus correcting the mindset of the Jewish people. They thought they were the chosen people of God. Therefore, they deserved extra special attention from God. And, and when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, it says, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Nicodemus did not believe that. Nicodemus did not believe that God loved the world. God loved the Jews and God blessed the Jews. The world, they were ugly, gross, like let's not involve them. God doesn't love them, he loves us. And so there's, there's these drops all over the place. Like Jesus is dropping morsels like, 
The bread of life is not just for the Jews. You guys don't have a stranglehold on the love of God. The bread of life has, has come to give life to the world. And, but, but they like it. Verse 34, they say, sir, they said, always give us this bread. I don't think they quite understand it. I think they're thinking very literally still here again. Maybe they're thinking, hey, he's going to give us 40 years of life-giving uh, bread. I think there's some similarities between this story and the way Jesus is teaching with metaphors and when he talks with the woman at the well, right? Do you remember that? And Jesus says, hey, um, I could give you water and you'd never be thirsty. And she says, give me this water so I don't ever have to come back to this place again because this place is full of shame and hurt and it's embarrassing for me. I come in the middle of the day because like I don't want to see anyone. I don't want to make eye contact with anyone. Like, Give me water so I'd never have to come here again. Even Nicodemus, right? In John chapter three, he's talking about how Jesus said you must be born again. Jesus is saying, hey, all your religious activity, you've got to start all over. And like none of it works. You've got to be completely recreated, reborn. And, and Nicodemus said what? How, wait, what? I'm supposed to like enter into my mother's womb for a second time? Like, and so they're thinking very, very literally, but Jesus is teaching in metaphors, trying to connect their heart to a very spiritual idea. They say, give us this bread. Uh, always give us this bread. Verse 35, then Jesus declares, okay, he said, give us this bread. Jesus declared, I am that bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You see it again. It says, whoever comes to me, he's using pictures, I believe. I don't, I don't think he's saying, like, we're all going for lunch after this, right? We're going to get hungry, right? I don't think Jesus is saying, if you come to me, you're never going to want to stop at McDonald's ever again. I don't think he's saying, you're never going to want to go to 7-Eleven and get a big gulp. Jesus is saying, spiritually, you have a greater thirst, a greater hunger than any physical uh, hunger or thirst that you have. And Jesus is trying to connect these ideas of, hey, you wake up every day and you have this hunger. You wake up every day and you have this thirst. When we were in Spain, even in Israel, like the, the heat was so oppressive. I just want something to drink. It's not like, hey, I could, I could use a drink. It's like, I need a drink or I'm going to die. Jesus is trying to connect these daily metaphors, pictures, hungers, thirst that they have to a much deeper spiritual issue. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I would circle verse 35. I think it's one of the, it's as clear there as it can be. How do you come to Jesus? If he is the bread of life, how do you come to Jesus? It says, believe. It's, it's so clear. He's not saying do good works. The work is to believe. He said it twice already. C.S. Lewis, I love the way he says it. C.S. Lewis says, I cannot find a cup of tea which is big enough or a book that is long enough, right? Like you have something and at some point it's just not enough. You have a marriage that works really good. At some point, that person doesn't fulfill all the, the desires and needs that you thought that they were going to. You buy something brand new. It gets old. It gets rusty. Or it breaks. Or you just kind of like, that was a stupid purchase. And it doesn't make you excited like it used to. He's saying, um, we're never satisfied. I cannot find a cup of tea which is big enough or a book that is long enough. St. Augustine said it this way. You made us for yourself. And our hearts will find no peace until they rest in you. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to say here. It's like, I'm the bread of life. If you come to me, you'll never be hungry. If you believe in me, you'll never be thirsty. But then he, he says really directly in verse 36, but as I told you, you have seen me. And when he says, seen me, you've seen the signs that I have done and you still, still you do not believe. <clears throat> Verse 37, I think Jesus is saying, hey, you're not thinking deep enough. Verse 37, as those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Like, let that sink in just for a little bit. Like, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. There's this idea that somehow you are beyond the grace of God. Twice in these three verses alone, Jesus says, if you come to me, regardless of your past, not if you're Jewish, not if you're Gentile, if you're a good person, you've done, if you come to me, if you believe in me, I'm never gonna drive you away. It's so easy to like throw people away in the society, isn't it? Think about the worst offenders in this life, the things that they have done, the people you will never forgive, the people that are sitting on death row. Jesus said, hey, if you come to me, that's not a disqualifier. 
If you, come, if you actually come to the place to believe that I am the Savior and the Messiah, there is no background that's a disqualifier. I won't chase you away. That's a beautiful, beautiful truth. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Now he's not just saying, like, I'm going to give you life. When you die, I will raise you up and you will experience eternal life. Verse 40, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes, third time we've seen believe, and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. I, I think verse 30 is just as strong as John 3, 16. It says so clearly that my father's will, God's will is that anyone that comes to the son and believes in him, that they will have eternal life and that eternal life looks like even when you die, you will be raised up. Like do your worst in this life to whatever your body is, but your soul, God is going to raise again one day. That, that's the truth here. there. This is a fairly complicated uh, teaching in Scripture, and we see it in a number of passages. This idea of God's responsibility and man's responsibility. Some people call it Calvinism. Some people call it election. Some people call it predestination. And we're not going to get into that today. That's not the main point of this passage. But I will say this. I don't want us to get bogged down here. I know it's difficult. Everywhere, that if you're expecting Jesus to like kind of explain that to you, he actually kind of is all over the map. He's just, Jesus is all over the map, right? He's teaching two things that seem like they are in contradiction to one another. But the first thing you can count on is that there is God's part, that God will draw, that he will take them and he will keep them until the end of the story. And that, that involves giving them eternal life and raising them on the last day, that God is going to draw, Jesus is going to keep, and he's going to raise them on the last day. I don't think it'd be possible for us to come to Jesus unless God draws us. I think that's a clear, uh, a clear teaching in scripture. And... He will not drive away any that come to him. Like there's no disqualifier for your background. The second thing is our part. Our part is to what? Three times it said it. What is our part? To believe. So there's God's part and our part. Can I just really challenge you? Don't worry about God's part. I don't think you're going to figure that out completely. I just don't think there's really smart, godly people that love to fight about this kind of stuff. I'm not one of those. I think that it's clear in scripture that there, God has a part in drawing us, keeping us, holding us to the end, giving us eternal life and not holding your past against you. Like no disqualifier. That's God's part. You can really try and understand it, try and make it fit together. But it, it, it's almost, almost impossible for me in my small brain uh, in Nebraska public education as well to try and make these two fit together. I'm not that concerned about God's part. I don't have to make God do his part. He's responsible for his part. What is, my, what is my part to come? And how do I come? I believe. So whatever your theology is, um, your part, our part is simply to believe that Jesus is the savior of the world, that he is the bread of life that comes down from heaven and that he will keep us and hold us to the end. Is that good? Okay. You doing okay? This is heavy stuff, I know, but... When you preach through the Bible, you're going to come across these heavy passages. Verse 41, if you're grumbling at this, that's okay. You, they were too. At this, the Jews, and whenever John says the Jews, he doesn't mean like the Jewish race. He means the religious leaders. Jesus was a Jew. His disciples were Jews. A lot of the people that were following Jesus were Jews. Almost always, John means the religious leaders. So he's in the synagogue. You see the, the setting that he's in. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? I, inflection is mine, but that's how I, that's how I like to read that. Like, we know Joseph, we know Mary. How can this Jesus, like Joseph and Mary at this point might actually be living in Capernaum. That is kind of Jesus and his disciples' new home. That's where they kind of base all their ministry out of. Jesus addresses them. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. You see that there again. And I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him 
comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who was from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. Circle verse 47 again. Jesus says, the one who believes has eternal life. Like it's four times already in this passage. This, this uh, verse 43 through 46 um, Jesus is kind of reiterating the idea that he is from God. None of you have seen God, but you believe that the prophets would be taught from God. And I'm telling you, no one is better qualified to teach you about God than me. I'm the only one that's seen him. I am God. If you want to know what God is like, look at me and I will teach you what God is like. Maybe you, I'm not pointing fingers at you, but maybe you religious leaders, Jesus is saying, don't know God quite as well as you think you know him because you're not listening to me and I'm the most qualified person to teach you who God is because I come from him. I do his will. That's what he is saying in those verses. Verse 47, though, is the main point. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. And I know I'm emphasizing that a lot because it's gonna give context for what's about to follow. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. He says it again. Your ancestors, so now he brings it back to Moses, and this is uh, Exodus 16, or yeah, I believe it's 16 or 13. You can go back and read this story. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. Yep, you're talking about that miracle. And yet they died. Like God did this miracle, kept them alive for 40 years, but none of them are around now. They all still died. He's saying, you guys set your hopes like so low. You set what you're actually asking from me at such a low barrier. Look around. The miracle that Moses, that God did through Moses that sustained his people in the wilderness for 40 years, amazing, right? I agree. And what I can do for you is just light years beyond that. Like you guys are so distracted from your present circumstances that you can't see what is actually happening. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. Verse 50, but here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am living, the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Again, the life of the world. Uh, I believe that this is a reference to John chapter one. Um, Jesus is making reference like in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word uh, was God. And then it says, and, and he became flesh, and, and, which means the incarnation of Christ, basically, that, that God put on flesh. It's the same Greek word here. Um, that's really hard. I believe that Jesus is talking in metaphors. I don't believe Jesus says, I'm a loaf of bread, uh, and I came down from heaven and come and eat some bread. And I, I'm going to try and unpack that for you as best as I can. Verse 52 that's not what they thought either. They didn't think Jesus was a loaf of bread. Then the Jews or the religious leaders began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That was not okay by the law. They could not eat human flesh. They could not um, eat as cannibals. They are still thinking literally like, wait, I don't understand. I don't understand. Like Jesus is using this metaphor, but they're, they're still thinking physically, uh, literally just like Nicodemus, just like the woman at the well. Uh, it's a common, common problem even today, right? Um, so they're asking, are you wanting us to like come and like take a bite of your arm? Like, I, I don't understand what's actually happening. So this, next, this section really has caused a lot of confusion over the years. I'm gonna try to address this in a very nice way. The band and all the production people got my fiery uh, version of it backstage. So you guys are welcome for that. That was free. Um, I'm trying to tame it back a little bit because I, there, there's a problem, and I'm going to try to say this the nicest way I can. Some of you come from a church, church background um, where the Eucharist, where communion, that the, the bread and the wine that you see around, we don't have wine, we have juice, we're Baptist, but uh, <laughs> um, the, the wine and the bread, the bread that, that the, the pastor or the priest holds up in front of you, or the wine, it is or it becomes the actual blood the actual body, flesh of Jesus Christ. That's your church background. It comes from this passage. The teaching comes from this passage. I think it's a mistake. I don't think, number one, I think that the context is so clear. Four times we see in here, the way to salvation is not through eating the, the, the actual flesh, the actual juice, the actual wine. That is not where salvation comes from. Now, 
So at best, it's a misinterpretation of the context of the entire book of John. Do you know that even in, in John's rendition of the gospel, the Lord's Supper, the, the only thing that's in John's, if, if he meant here that, hey, you know what? It's actually the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ that we must perform some miracle, transubstantiation, so that you can have salvation only through this. If that was John's main point, don't you think he would have mentioned it later on? Do you know that John doesn't even mention this part of his upper room discourse? In chapter 13, chapter 13 through 17 is the, the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper in the book of John. You can read it. Nowhere in there does he even mention the breaking of the bread and Jesus passing it. Or this is my blood, take this drink. He doesn't even mention it. In the other gospels, it's mentioned. John doesn't mention it. Why? Because it's unimportant to what actually is necessary for salvation. He wants us to believe. He doesn't want you to, okay, uh, this is the miracle. You need to eat the flesh. You need to drink the blood. And, and I'm, I'm coming across, John, because at best, at best, it is the misinterpretation of the context of this passage. At worst, and I'll try and tame this down. I got it out of my system a couple of times this week, but it's still in there. At worst, it is religion and government mixing to control people. There is somehow we hold something that you need from God. And if we don't like you, you do something that we don't like, we can cut you off from this source of salvation. And no longer does your belief matter because you no longer have access to what actually saves your soul. This is the flesh. This is the blood of Christ. So I can excommunicate you from my church. And so now I have leverage. Now I have power. So I don't want to believe that's actually where it came from, but... Any religious leader that tries to exhort power over the followers just needs to be called on the carpet. I believe transubstantiation is a theology that was developed to control people. It is not a good reading of the scriptures. I, Jesus is talking in metaphors the entire chapter. The entire chapter he's talking about metaphors. I'm the bread that's come down from heaven. And, and like, of course you're going to be thirsty. Of course you're going to be hungry. Why all of a sudden now are we taking everything literal from here on out in the passage? It doesn't make any sense at all. So I got that off my chest. If you come from that church background, you want to come talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it. I think at, at best, it's a misunderstanding of the context of this passage. At worst... It's an effort to control people because we can keep something from you that no longer you have access to and excommunicate you from access to this miracle that I perform. We at Calvary, we don't teach that. We don't believe that. I, I believe four times in this passage, John has made it abundantly clear what is necessary for your salvation. My, your relationship with me? No. Your relationship with how you do communion? No. What is necessary for salvation that he may keep you, draw you, hold you, and raise you up on the last day that you would? Believe, I have no leverage over you at all, zero. You and God are the only two people involved in this transaction. You have a choice to make. I have zero leverage over you. The idea of communion wasn't even introduced for a whole nother year. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay, are you doing okay? I had to get that off my chest. I'm so sorry, you guys. Verse, verse 53. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. If this is talking about the Eucharist, it is Jesus is now talking contradictory to everything that he has taught thus far. To everything he's taught thus far. Believe, believe, believe. Oh yeah, by the way, you gotta eat my flesh, you have to, you have to drink my blood. Jesus is making it very clear that the way that you come to him for eternal life is to believe. And it, what he's busting their chops over is, I've shown you, I've given you the signs, and yet you still do not believe. It, Jesus continues to drive that home. All right, we're going to end here. Just the last few verses are going to race through them because we're out of time. If you want to have a conversation with me about this theology, I'd love to talk with you about it. it it's, it's so rich. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Again, there's that promise. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. I think he's saying, you have all these like empty desires that you're going to be hungry tomorrow. Like, I can give you something spiritually that is real, more real than anything you could touch, anything you could desire, a pleasure here on this earth. What I can give you is so much more real than that. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. John 15, we're going to revisit that. Jesus says, I am the true vine. He's speaking out a picture again. And you're the branch. And if you're not with me, you can do nothing. Uh, verse 58. I think we're at verse 57. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. So again, I, I don't want us to get sidetracked by these two major theological ideas that God draws, election, predestination, and the idea of transubstantiation. Here, here's the choice that you have to make. And Johnny's going to come. He's going to lead us through a time of communion. But here's the choice that I said you'd have to make at the end of this talk. It's time. The exact same choice that Jesus gave the religious leaders and the thousands of people that were there listening to him. They say, hey, give us a sign. We want to believe in you. And Jesus says, I've shown you everything that you need to believe in me. But you won't because I don't fit into your theological compartments. You want something now that's comfortable, that, can, that you can touch. What I'm offering you is so much greater than any of that. The choice that each one of us is faced with is whether or not you believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Whether or not you believe that the temporary satisfaction these people were looking for in this life, that actually, it, okay, it's significant and Jesus is not unconcerned about the welfare of you and what you're going through. Please don't hear that. Jesus is very concerned about your struggle, very concerned about your circumstance. He's concerned about your dreams that you have for one day. He's concerned about your shattered dreams that you've had to let go of. All that is true. And, but, in addition, even greater is Jesus is offering you eternal life. When in Jesus is comparing those two in this passage, like, you guys got to set your sights a little higher. You guys got to dream for something that's out of this world. I can give that to you, and you can only get that through believing in me. It says it four times in this passage. So that, that's what I want to challenge you with. Is you guys close your eyes and bow your head. My hope is that you find deep fulfillment in this life in Jesus Christ. I believe that can happen. Regardless of your circumstance, Jesus can fulfill your deepest desires in this life. I believe that. But Jesus offers you something much greater. This life can do its dirtiest to you. It can, it can just chew you up and spit you out. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, put your faith and your trust in him, none of that eternal promise can be stripped away. Why? Because it's not dependent on you, not dependent on the world. Jesus is the one that's drawing and holding and making sure you don't get away from him. That's all Jesus and that's guaranteed. So if you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, like maybe your circumstances have kept you from it, or maybe you've just never like thought about it enough, can I just challenge you today? The main point of this message is that you would choose today to believe in Jesus Christ as the savior of your soul, as the one who holds your eternity steadfast, and so if you've never done that, I just want to give you a chance to pray that prayer with me. And it can go something like this. You don't have to pray it out loud. You can pray it in your heart. Dear God, I know that I've sinned. I know I've done wrong things. I know I've been distracted by the things in this life. I haven't really thought about you enough. Or when I think about you, sometimes it's not in a good way. Or that somehow I'm not good enough. Today, Jesus, I place my faith in you. I believe in you as my Lord and Savior who can seal me and keep me and life can do its worst. And I am held fast in you, guaranteed to raise us up on the last day and give us eternal life. Today, Jesus, I choose you. I ask you to come into my life, be my Lord and Savior and give me eternal life that begins now and last for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.